Hello? The, what's up? Uh, you speak Polish, right? Supposedly, yeah. Um, All right. Yeah, yeah, so, I do. I do. Yeah. You know the iPhone keyboard, right? I've, I'm aware of it. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've um, heard of it. Maybe. <laughs> All right. So I might have made a bad version of the iPhone keyboard. I mean, the iPhone keyboard kind of sucks. So I think you succeeded. You're right. So, um, would you be able to make a sentence for me to chuck into this keyboard? Yeah, this hypothetical yeah, keyboard? Yeah, let me just... Yeah, let me just... Yeah, this should work. Alright, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Um, tell me, what is your opinion of this text? Well, it added the word, the world. <laughs> and then okay. it started looping filler words. Uh, would, would, you consider, like... would you consider that accurate to the um, iPhone keyboard experience? Yeah, um, yeah. IPhone, with iPhone, you get maybe Great, like... thank you. Thanks for watching our video. Uh, I hope you enjoy the suggestions shown on screen. Just kidding. How not to make a text prediction model. In the modern era, text and word prediction is one of the most prevalent cases of artificial intelligence. So our group decided, hey, how hard could it be? And tasked ourselves with creating our own, admittedly basic, word predictor. Theoretically, it's simple. You start with a bunch of text, obtained ethically of course, and convert the words in them to tokens. Tokenization. Tokenization is a method of breaking up text into its individual words. For example, in the sentence, the cat sat on the mat, the tokens would be the, cat, sat, on, and mat. You then convert the sentences into sequences of tokens. To take from the example above, the cat sat on the mat would become 012304. Once all the sentences have been converted to sequences, they have to be padded to make sure that the, all the sequences are the same length. This is so that they can be used to train the model. Now that we have tokens, it's time to talk about the model. We're using an LSTM, which is a specialized type of recurrent neural network that is better at remembering long-term dependencies in sequential data. Basically, it stores a self-state where it calculates what to remember, what it should add, and what it should focus on. Here's an example. Let's say you have a number, it's 50. And the forget gate tells you to only keep 80% of that number, so it would be 40. The input gate would say add 20 to the number, so now you'd have 60. And the output gate would then tell you to use 70% of this number in your actual value, which it would then be 42, while keeping this value updated for the future training. This allows it to forget what is unimportant and remember what is important. So our next step is to train the model. Training the model. Basically, when we train the model, we have to avoid two things overfitting and underfitting. To check for these, we use two types of parameters, accuracy and loss. Accuracy is a simple percentage of whether the predicted word is a correct one or not, and loss is the distance between the predicted words and the actual words that are present in the data. Underfitting basically means that the model doesn't have all the information out of the data that it can get. It's solved by simply training the model for longer. Overfitting is when the model's output is too close to the training data, which means that it's unable to adapt to new input. You can avoid overfitting by checking the model against validation data, particularly loss. When loss is as low as possible, that means it's most likely to be in the ballpark of the correct word for the new data as well. It then trains over many epochs, and as it progresses and trains over many iterations, it checks for loss to check how the model is fitting to the data. I'll tell you more about fitting later. Instead, we'll talk about the next part, which is word prediction. Prediction. Basically, to predict the words, we tokenize the input sentence and run it through the model again, and we will get numbers that correspond to a token, along with their percentage. We then assume that the token with the highest percentage is the next word, so we choose it and add it to the sentence. We then repeat this process for as long as we want. Okay, great. If we've got our model and we can train it, then why is this video about how not to make a text prediction model? Anyway, trials and tribulations. So, our models are somewhat cursed. I'll tell you why. Why? It all started a long, long time ago. 
Two days ago, I started the project by following a simple tutorial on geeksforgeeks.com. This example project was a good starting point, but it had some flaws that I'll get to later. While training the example, I noticed that it was using my CPU to calculate the weights. Now, I do have a 4070, for educational reasons, of course. Because it's an NVIDIA card, I have the ability to use CUDA. In theory, I should be able to use CUDA to make training much, much faster. And this is where I ran into my first issues. First of all, TensorFlow for Windows Native doesn't support CUDA anymore. But that's okay, because I also use Linux, Arch by the way, on my computer. So I booted into Linux and started the process of setting up CUDA. Now if you know anything about Linux, you'll know that almost anything becomes a royal pain once it becomes more difficult than just installing a package. And this was more difficult than installing a package. So after failing to get CUDA working for about an hour, I switched back to Windows and set up Plan B. Windows Subsystem for Linux. By using Windows Subsystem for Linux, I can use CUDA while on Windows. In theory, setup is simple, just install the driver, the Windows Subsystem for Linux driver, and hit play. This, however, assumes you're on WSL2. Unfortunately, I was still on WS1 because I had set it up ages ago. So I installed it, realized it didn't work, uninstalled it, reinstalled it with version 2 instead, and then it finally worked. Now I could train a model with my graphics card. Model 1, 1989. So, in my naivety, I started out with the smallest data set, the data from 1989. Wait a second, I never explained the data set. The data set. Now, why was it that I had to ask my friend about if they spoke Polish? Well, our data is specifically about Polish political articles about China. Why is this? Well, there was a research project where I was tasked with scraping data from a Polish news source about China based on years. As such, I have a lot of text on my computer about China in Polish. Back to the model. This was the first model that we trained. It was trained on 300 kilobytes of data from 1989. We ran 500 epochs without any overfitting prevention methods, which took about 3 hours. As such, it was extremely overfitted to the point where it would just repeat the same exact sentence from the training data. In a way, this was pretty useful for what we were trying to research with our project. Wait, I haven't explained that either. Research project? So, because we have text data from a bunch of years in history from the Polish political news source, we thought it would be interesting if we could train a model for each individual year. Then, we could feed each model its own seed sentence to see what the general public sentiment towards China was based on that time period. In theory, this would have been cool, but unfortunately, our models decided otherwise. Because of this disappointing result, I wonder what would happen if I trained all of the text at once for one big model. Model 2, the whole shebang. This model, in theory, would be much better than the other one in terms of performance and general knowledge. There was about a total of 180 megabytes of training data that it could feed from. 20% of that could be used for validation. Now, this model was much bigger, so I knew that it would use a lot more RAM. What I was not expecting was that it would take almost 70 terabytes of RAM. This is because we were using a one-hot encoding, which is a special type of matrix encoding where a value points to a column representing a number instead of just representing the number itself. This can improve training performance, but has a small drawback of using an exponentially large amount of RAM depending on the size of the training dataset. Because of this, we removed the one-hot encoder and just put the default values in. This still used more RAM than I had, though. We cut the dataset in half, and finally, it could run on my computer. Training started, and it would take 10 hours per epoch. That's not good. We didn't have a lot of time to do this, but I decided to let it train overnight on my computer anyway. If we could get one epoch out of it, that would be enough to get some interesting data. But tragedy struck. You remember how I tried getting CUDA to work on Linux but couldn't? I switched it back to Windows instead and trained it through WSL. This decision came back to bite me in the butt. At 6 a.m., Bill Gates himself decided that my incredible model was too powerful for Microsoft's bottom line, so the unthinkable happened. Windows update. Now, the model only saves after an epoch is finished training. When the update happened, it was not yet complete. As a result, all of our data was lost. This was bad. We were running out of time, so we turned to our most powerful weapon. The professor had a computer with an RTX 4090 that we could use to train our model. Later that afternoon, we set that computer up with the same files as I had on my computer. 
And to our dismay, the 4090 wasn't exactly the gift from the gods it was promised to be. It would still take 5 hours to train the full model per epoch. This meant we needed to pivot. Model 3, 2012. We decided to pick a smaller file for our training. This would end up being 2012 with about 6 megabytes of data to train on. We finished training this model and got an output. However, we ran into yet another issue. When you are generating text, there's two parts. There's a text, and there's the numbers that the text is connected to. Unfortunately, the file that the text was connected to was broken. No matter what we did, it had an index error where the index would be equal to zero no matter what. We also had a problem with the model training where it would always ramp up to essentially 100% accuracy. We knew something was wrong. I had adjusted the parameters on the training data previously. What could it be? To check, we used the original method again, without the one-hot encoding. It worked again, but that means our old 2012 model didn't work at all. Once we ran it, we found that the new scripts would work, and we tested getting an output from the saved model. Everything was good to go. We pressed start, we let it run, set to stop at 50 epochs. After the first 5 epochs, it stopped. At first, we were confused on why it would stop so early. After all, shouldn't it run for 50? The reason it stopped is because it was immediately overfitting the data. I had added a callback after the problem from the 1989 model to reduce the chances of it overfitting, and as such, it was set to stop if the loss was increased for 4 epochs in a row. And as it turns out, the first epoch had the lowest loss. We had two options. We could either decrease the model size or to increase the training data. We chose the latter. Model 4, 2008. The year 2008 had almost doubled the amount of data as 2012 did, at about 12 megabytes. This would help reduce overfitting the model. We knew that the scripts we used for 2012 worked, so we simply swapped the file names out and set it to run overnight. In the morning, I grabbed the files from the computer and tested them. They output text. What a relief. I hopped on a voice call with my Polish friend to ask about the results. So what do you think about the 1989 model? Um, well the 1989 model, um, well I found that it's derivative, you can very much tell that it's just copying something. It's grammatically, you can guess, um, how, like, sentences kind of work, but it doesn't really seem to, like, it obviously doesn't know what it's talking about at all, so it's just spitting words at you, but, you know, at least you can read it <laughs> and normally, so... I'm not, I'm not saying you can't read the other sentences, but um, what I meant for that was that in some way it's kind of comprehensible. Okay, now what do you think about the uh, 2008 model? Well, um, after maybe adding, it seems to have favorite phrase, a couple favorite phrases of its own. It can add, what, like one word or two before it starts repeating random words ad nauseum. It's, um, it's very comparable to the way the Apple uh, keyboard suggests new words to use. How if you click at them enough, it just loops and to and this that. One could pretend is functional, the other one, uh, not really. Got it. Thanks for the help. And with that, let's move on to our conclusion. Conclusion. It turns out we had two models on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. The first model, 1989, was extremely overfitted. My friend noted that the sentence structure made sense, but the words used in the sentence don't mean anything at all. It was just a bunch of big words jumbled together, to pretending to be a real sentence. Another thing we noted is that if we put the first couple of words of a sentence from the training data in, it would then spit out the rest of that sentence. Because the model was so overfitted, the sentences were somewhat useful to see what topics were important at the time, because it would just ramble about large words that were somewhat related to the input text. Meanwhile, the 2008 model was extremely underfitted. When presented with a sentence, it would just say some random word, then repeat two common phrases from the training data. This would be Nie jest to, że nie jest to, że and Nie ma się na to, że nie ma się na to, że this was extremely reminiscent of a smartphone keyboard, where it would end up looping into a meaningless sentence if you use text prediction over and over again. In a way, that means we succeeded in our task. If you consider the task to be making an extremely mediocre smartphone keyboard text prediction model. Also, my friend said that they would not use it personally. Granted, they don't use the built-in one either, so that means we're on par with a multi-billion dollar corporation. Yay yeah, us? In general, it did not seem to be functional. There was another place where we technically succeeded. 
Do you remember that 2012 model where it would always output zero? That's because of the way that we padded the sequences. When you train AI, you need to have matrices, and all of these matrix values have to be filled in. As a result, when your sentence length is less than the max sentence length, you have to pad around it. Mistakenly, we chose to use post padding instead of pre padding. What this means is that after a sentence, it would be a bunch of zeros. This means that an extremely common output for the next word would be exactly that, zero. Because of this, our model perfectly matched our input data. Another victory for us. Overall, none of our models were exactly what we were looking for. If we had more time, there's a chance we might have been able to get one that we wanted, but it's likely that we would have had to spend a lot more time training and using smaller training increments as well. That is something we were not able to test with, where if we trained with smaller changes per epoch, we could get more epochs going, and that would help fit our model most accurately to our data. Maybe in the future, we'll revisit this project and try and complete it to, our, to the best of our ability.